Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time we have. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the peace of God, which passes all understanding to rule our hearts and minds. We thank you for your word. It is powerful. It is sharp. And today, Father, we are ready to hear what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Before I do that, Mom, Dad, you want to say anything? (laughs) Give them a big hand. Amen. It's good to have you on the front row. Did you bring me a signed bulletin from where you've been visiting? (laughs) Fill out a visitor card. If you go back to guest services, we've got a cup for you. We'd like to be a blessing to you. Amen. Well, this is a little bit of a one-off today, but I really felt impressed to the Lord to talk about pressure. Amen. Anybody dealing with any pressure in your life right now? Huh? Who in the room could say, Pastor Jack, I have never in my life dealt with the type of pressure that I'm dealing with right now in my life. It's, it is, it's all over. Um, it's the reason why so many people are doing things that we would just consider so outside of the boundaries of normal. And it's because of the amount of pressure that's being applied to people. Um, it is causing whatever is in us to come out of us. And for some of us, that's good. But for others, it's not so good. And uh, so I just felt inclined of the Lord to talk a little bit about pressure. The Bible does talk a lot about pressure. It calls it tribulation. Amen. In Bible speak, it's called tribulation. It's a Greek word. I think it's called thespius. And tribulation is the example that it gives is if you had a stack of loose papers and you press down on all of those papers, it pushes out anything that was between those pieces of paper, making it compact. Does anybody feel like you've been a stack of papers and something has pressed down on top of you and squeezed out all the air in between? Amen. How many people in the room could be honest and say, Pastor, really one of the things that I'm dealing with is financial pressure? Sure. How about job pressure? Now, everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. How about marriage pressure? Oh, two hands. Oh, I saw men and women with double hands up in the air. (laughs) Yeah, there's pressure. And uh, the Bible does give us recourse on what we're supposed to do as a believer about overcoming tribulation. Amen? Amen. So, how you handle pressure will determine your success in any venture. How you handle pressure will dictate your success in anything that you're doing right now. Anything that you're doing, whether it's for the Lord or anybody else, at some point there's going to be pressure that's applied to you to make sure that you're really serious about what you're doing. Pressure. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. I'm going to read this out of the New King James, and I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Proverbs 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. The New Living Translation says, If you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. Strength is not measured in good times It's measured in bad times. Strength is not measured in good times. Your strength is measured when you are put under pressure. We are living in a season where it, where, excuse me, we are living in a season where what is in you has to be greater than what is coming against you. Now, it was in my mind do we have any water bottles in here? You have a full water bottle, Dan? Can I have that? Oh, he's going to throw it. <laughs> Do I have an empty water bottle? Let me have that one, Robin. There you go. Chug it. <laughs> Put the lid on tight. All right. Two water bottles. Same company, same plastic, same lid. Exactly the same. When pressure is applied to this one, I thought I could get the lid off, but I can't. 
There you go. <laughs> What's in it, the pressure that was put against it, there was not a force inside of it that was greater to push it back, right? Who's brave? No. Now, I could squeeze with this one all day, and nothing's going to happen. Why not? Because there's something inside of it. If there's something inside of it, when pressure is applied against it, it's not going to buckle because there's something inside of it. If we run around as an empty bottle and we're not filling ourselves on a regular basis with the Word of God or the things of God, then we're an empty bottle. And when pressure comes, we're just gonna get crumpled with no matter what pressure is put against us. But when I stay full, amen. amen, and this is the key about today, is we have to stay filled. If you will stay full of the word of God, if you will stay in your Bible, if you will pray in other tongues, if you will continue, and let me just help you real fast, if you will get connected, whatever church you're supposed to be in, and when I say connected, it means more than just coming on a Sunday morning. Amen. It means connected. It means I'm giving. It means I'm sowing. It means I'm serving. It means I'm helping. It means I'm giving of my time, my talent, and my treasuries. The more that I'm connected, the more I'm staying filled up. So when the pressures of life come, the force that's greater inside of me is greater than any circumstance that's coming against me. That's what that verse really means. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That means what's inside of me is bigger than any circumstance that might try and come against me. So I have to stay filled. Amen? Say, stay filled. First Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And that's a Greek word, kalipos, kelepos. Perilous means harsh. Savage, difficult, dangerous, painful, fierce, grievous, and hard to deal with. It means a society that is barren in virtue, but abounding in vices. There is so much pressure right now in the world. Now there's pressure that's coming down from heaven because Jesus is coming soon. Amen, and heaven is coming closer to us every day. Amen? Yes, Jesus is going to appear. I was looking at some clouds the other day with Luke in the car, and I said, Luke, look at those clouds. Those are Jesus coming back type clouds. I mean, all I want to see is this giant sandal come through it and be like, here we go. I am ready to go. There is so much in the world right now. I mean, we really are living like in the days of Noah. Amen? What, what is called evil is now good, and what's good is now called evil. And that is the epitome of wicked times, of perilous times. But we're not to fear. Amen. Amen. Psalm 91 works under the best of circumstances and under the worst of circumstances. Amen. There's no time, there's no time limit on Psalm 91. I can let my kids go out into this world and know that they're going to be divinely protected. My daughter is a first responder. She's an EMT. She works different venues and things like that. I know when I release her to go out there that the blood of Jesus is over her and she's gonna return home safe because that's her calling. Because that's what she's called to do, therefore she's graced to do it, therefore she's divinely protected to do it. That's why you wanna be in God's will right now. I mean, you wanna make sure that whatever you're doing, you're doing it in faith and you're doing it in God's will. Amen? So, I love this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. It says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. The only way Paul could say that is because he had a greater revelation of the Christ in him than the pressure that was assigned against him. And when we get to the point where we have a revelation that greater is he that's in me. See, I kept saying this over people when I was praying over because I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, tell them that. You're not alone. Hallelujah. Quit thinking that you're alone. 
Quit thinking that no one loves me, that no one knows that I'm here, that no one knows that I even exist. If I left the earth today, no one would even know it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You were created to carry the glory of God. We were created in the very image of God. Adam and Eve were created to walk with God in the cool of the day. They were created to walk in the spirit with God. Guess what? We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We were all created with the capacity to walk with God. There's not a person in this room that's missing that part. There's not a person in this room that cannot or is not created with the capacity to walk with the glory of God. We all have it. We were made in his image. That word hard pressed means to constrict. It means to compress. It means to oppressively afflict. It means distress. In reality, it means, hard-pressed means, when circumstances rub us the wrong way, that makes us feel confined, hemmed in, and restricted to a narrow place. A lot of times what the enemy will do is he will give us lying feelings that the walls are just closing in on us. I just feel so constricted. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't say anything. I can't get away. I'm trapped. Have you ever felt trapped? Be honest. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You're not. Those are lying symptoms from an enemy that's trying to get you to cast away your confidence and to throw away your faith. You are never alone. As long as you have the word of God, as long as you've got the word in you, you are undefeatable. And remember this, anything, anybody feel like you're in a boxing match right now with something? Anybody feel like you are fighting something right now? Guess what? Whatever is in the ring with you, Jesus already whooped. Anything that you are dealing with right now, God will not put anything in the ring with you that he hasn't already defeated. Think about that. That means whatever it is that you're dealing with, whether it's marriage, whether it's children, whether it's job, whether it's finances, whether it's health, it's all been defeated under the blood of Jesus. You already have the victory. All you have to do is just pick up where Jesus left off and be his hands and be his feet and be his mouth and do what Jesus did. If you want Bible results, then you gotta do what they did in the Bible. You've got to do what the Bible says to get Bible results. When Jesus said, speak to the mountain, he didn't say, let the mountain depress you. He didn't say, run from the mountain. He didn't say, beat your head against the mountain. He told us very specifically, what do we do to the mountain? Speak to it. If you had faith, you would say. Problem is, is we don't say, we sit. I like what Mark Hankins says. If you are running towards a giant right now, you run at it with your mouth open. David ran at Goliath and he was speaking to him as he came. You foul, unclean, uncircumcised Philistine. And he's coming at him with the sling. Now to Goliath, he's like, come on. Really? Really? This is it. Little four foot seven redhead kid with a sling is gonna come, I'm Goliath. I am big, I am bad. I have slain thousands with one hand. And this is the best that you have. The devil loves pride and he loves praise. And when you laugh at the devil, it's the equivalent of putting a rock in a sling and hitting him right in the forehead. He hates to be laughed at. You need to laugh at the devil. You need to laugh at him. When he says something's not gonna happen, laugh at him. When he says it's not gonna happen, laugh at him. When he says he's gonna kill you, laugh at him. We have the victory. We've already won. Don't go back and refight battles that we've already won. We do not still go and attack Normandy today. We don't go back every year and attack Normandy. We don't have a D-Day invasion again. Once was enough back in 1945. 
that battle was so decisive that it basically ended the war in Europe. Why do we go back and think, all right, now I gotta get the ship and I gotta fill up the ship with men and I gotta go to the beach and I gotta land on the beach and I gotta fight through all that stuff? Anybody ever seen fighting, I mean, Saving Private Ryan, the first opening scene? It's brutal. We don't have to go through that ever again. The battle's been won. What I have to do is take my place in the word and I have to reinforce the victory that's already been given to me. How do I do that? By faith. Because he gave you grace. His grace, say this, his grace is sufficient for me. Think about that for a second. You don't need more grace. There's all the grace that you need for everything that you've been called to do. There's grace for your marriage, husbands and wives. Michelle and I have been married for 26 years. I wish I could tell you that all 26 of those years have been perfect. They haven't. I am not an easy person to live with. I'm a great person to live with. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Listen to me. I was the world's greatest husband until I got married. World's greatest father until I had kids. Amen? All marriage does was point out just how selfish you really are. It did. I mean, it just reveals it right there. I cannot believe how I cannot believe some of the stuff that I did at the beginning of our marriage and just thought it was normal. Oh yeah, honey, I work out seven days a week. Yeah, I'm gone a lot. Excuse me? Honey, you need to come home. Well, why? I always go work out. Yeah, but what about me? Well, what about you? You can go work out too if you want. <laughs> it was my thinking. This goes back to the offering. It's your thinking. I had, I had poor thinking about Mary. I had poor thinking about what my relationship was. I love my wife today. I love spending time with my wife today. It's a blessing. She's a blessing. Amen? But all that did, all marriage did, was just show me how selfish. And then the more children you add, then you really find out how selfish you really are. She wanted five. I wanted one. We had three. We met right there. When circumstances rub us the wrong way, amen, when circumstances, listen to me, don't let the circumstances of life make you feel hemmed in. Don't let the pressures, yes, there are things that we have to do. There are decisions that have to be made. Listen to me, don't put yourself in a position of financial crisis. Don't get a bunch of credit cards and just run them up and then just curse the devil because you're in debt. Satan did not sign the contract with Visa. We did. Don't go buy a car that you can't afford and then deal with the pressures of those things. What we do is we like call the prayer tower. We need prayer. I got bill collectors calling me, Jesus, help. Jesus did not put you in debt. You put you in debt. You don't need money, you need wisdom. The more money you had, the more foolish decisions you'll make. You need wisdom. Teach me, Lord, how to be a good steward. Teach me how to have a budget. Budget is not a bad word. It's a healthy thing. Amen, listen to me, this is big. If you spend more than what's coming in, you're producing what's called a deficit, unless you're the government. Because you just go print a bunch more to fill it. But we create these deficits in our lives. But listen to me. There's a biblical standard that we're to live by. Seed time and harvest. Amen. Amen. There is no such thing as the American dream. Where you can just go and do what you want. What we really have in America is opportunity. Because you are unfettered because of the government where you can go. And any person in this room, if you got a business you want to start, you can go start that business. There's an opportunity, but guess what? You gotta work your tail off for that business. It is not going to come naturally just because you decided to have a business. It's going to take work, but it should. We should be investing in ourselves. We had a young lady that gave a great testimony this morning, how she went to the doctor. She thought insurance would cover everything. She got a $500 bill, she didn't have the money. 
So this is what she said, and this is what blessed me. She said, you know what? I just started making small payments towards it. And then all of a sudden, I found out that that bill was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but not by me. So by the time I went in there to pay it off, it had already been paid off. And I said, that's how faith works. If you are not willing to invest in you, why should God? What we think is faith means free. Faith does not mean free. If we're not willing to sow into our own future, why should he? We should give. When she started giving towards that bill, maybe it's $2 a month. I don't care what it is. There's faith in that. We're not just waiting for supernatural debt cancellation. Oh, Jesus, please let the computer break and they lose all my information. <laughs> we have to be good stewards, ladies and gentlemen. We can't run from our duties. We can't run from our, what's the word? Responsibilities. We have to honor those responsibilities. As a good Christian, I need to honor my responsibilities. But listen to me. If you are buying things that you can't afford, trying to meet people that we're, we're out of order, you're trying to keep up with somebody, and I don't know who that is, but don't put yourself in a place where you are amassing all kinds of debt because the worst, the number one reason for divorce in America is money. The pressures that come through finances is one of the number one reasons people get divorced. The other two are sex and communication. Other two reasons. So don't put yourself under mountains and mountains of debt because it will affect your marriage. Amen? And husbands and wives, you need to be making financial decisions together. You need to pray before you buy something together. You need to have agreement before you do something together. There's not her, his money and her money. You're not married. It's together. You're in a covenant. Do you understand that, married couples? You're in a covenant with one another. One of my biggest issues when I got married is I tried to be married, but I thought singly. That's what got me in trouble. My mentality was is I was still single. The reality was I was married. So if you're trying to live single, but you're married, you're in deep trouble. You don't have a roommate, you have a wife. And you're in covenant with that person. And you will stand before God for how you treated that person. Man, I did not intend to go here this morning. <laughs> covenant. Say covenant. covenant. You're in a covenant, a blood covenant. Hallelujah. Oh, to our Western minds, that doesn't mean a whole lot, but to God, it means everything. Amen. It's covenant. It's covenant. Don't let the pressures of this world get between you and your spouse. Amen? Husbands, Pray for your wives. Speak the word over your wives. Like Ephesians says, wash them with the water of the word. Wash them, speak kindly to them. Give them the affection that's due to, their, to your wife. Amen? Don't be harsh. <laughs> be faithful. Be faithful. You be faithful to that woman. Be faithful. Do I understand? Be faithful. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Amen. <sighs> Pressure by nature is testing the integrity of what it's being applied to. It's testing to see if there's any compromise. When we get put under pressure, what's in us is what's going to come out. When you get really, really squeezed, I can bring a sponge in here, I can put it in water, I can squeeze it, I can squeeze it, I can squeeze it, but there's a whole new level of squeeze that I could put on it and I would still have liquid come out of it. What's in us under pressure is who we really are. It is checking our integrity. Is what you're saying really matching with what you believe? Is what you're doing really matching with what you believe? When you get under pressure, see what pressure is designed to do, and most of us do this, what's the first thing we wanna do when we get under pressure? We wanna get away from it. 
It is the most uncomfortable thing in the world. And folks, this is where stress comes from. This is where heart problems come from. This is where a, a whole number of things happen to us is because if we don't deal with the pressure, our bodies, see, this is, it's foreign to us. We were not created to handle pressure. Adam and Eve were not created to be stressed. They were not created for that. Therefore, when your body gets hit with stress, it goes, I do not know what this is, but I do not like it. And I want away from it as fast and as hard as I can. So what happens under pressure is either we run. Let me just give you a statistic. In America, we all know the statistic, 50% of marriages fail in America. 60% of all second marriages fail. 73% of all third marriages fail. Let me tell you the little dirty secret about pressure. You take it with you. You don't leave pressure in that situation with whom you just left. You take it with you. So the minute you get into this new relationship, as I was able to share on the broadcast the other day, and I'll end with this. When I grew up as a young man, I was raised right. My parents did a good job. We knew right from wrong, but I was very promiscuous as a young man, was in relationships way, way, way too young, and because of that, developed soul ties with people at a very, very young age. Developed jealousies, developed controls, 13, 14, 15 years old. Why? Because I was not emotionally able to handle that part of the relationship. That's why sex before marriage is so dangerous. Does everybody understand that? These young people that are, we were just saying, go do your life, be free. You know, if it feels good, do it. What you're, you're, they're not capable of handling it emotionally or mentally the responsibility that goes along with it. That's why it's a marriage that happens in a marriage couple. Sex was saved for marriage because it's between two adults that love each other, that don't lust each other. Amen? Because I had done that, I had developed some very, very, very bad habits. And so when I got saved, I quit dating. So guess what? I never dealt with jealousy. I never dealt with control. I never dealt with any of that for three years. Why? Because I wasn't dating. I'm just happy I got saved. I love Jesus. Everything's going to be okay. Well, I meet Michelle. I'm believing God for a wife. I meet Michelle. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, control, jealousy, and anger pop up. I'm like, what is this? I never dealt with it. I just repressed it. Just because there was no pressure being applied to that particular part of my life, I wasn't having to deal with it. It was always there, I just never dealt with it. So now I'm hurting her and I don't know why. I'm like, I, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm a born again, tongue talking, I work for Jerry Savelle. I got a suit. I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'm just, I'm happy. I'm going to Bible school. This is for somebody. You got to deal with your stuff. You got to deal with it. And so we went through a couple of times of just deliverance where I got delivered of all of that stuff. I had to go to the word and I had to renew my mind to that area and I got set free from it. But just because you stop doing something doesn't mean that you've dealt with it. You gotta deal with your stuff. You gotta bring it into the light because when pressure gets put on that again, it's going to manifest. That's why it's so important that we have to renew our minds. All pressure is made for is to find out the integrity. Say integrity. You can tell me you're the greatest guy that's ever lived all day long, but if we get on the golf course and I'm beating you by one stroke and you decide to kick that ball over a little bit because you don't like to lose, you got a little pressure put on you, your integrity just came out. You're telling me that when push comes to shove, you would rather kick that little ball out and have an extra shot than deal with the fact that you lost. It's our character, it's our integrity. Pressure is going to reveal all those types of things to us, who we really are. What you say to your spouse under pressure, 
man, I wish I could take back some of the stuff I've said under pressure. Because our tendency is, is we wanna blame the one that's the closest to us instead of dealing with the issues ourselves. Am I helping somebody this morning? We got to let what's in us be greater than the pressures that are coming against us. And the only way that that happens is if I am open and truly, we have to be honest with ourselves. I can think I'm a certain way, but if everybody says, if I keep doing the same thing over and over, if one person has a problem with you, okay, but if 10 people have the same problem with you, there's an issue. We gotta bring that issue into the light. And we gotta renew our minds in that area. And we gotta get free from the pressure of this life that we wake up with every day, amen? The Lord gave me a word, and I'm gonna end with this, gave me a word at the beginning of the year. He said, Jack, I am bringing you into a broad place, which is in the book of Job and Psalms and all that. I'm bringing you into a broad place. And I was like, man, Lord, that would be great. That'll be awesome. And it seemed like every demon in hell came against me from the minute that he said that. Every major appliance broke in my house. You know, tires were going flat, shirts were, I'm like, what? This is not a broad place, Jesus. I have been to this place and it is not called broad. This is confined, this is constricted. Well, of course the devil is, you're going to be tested in everything you believe. And what the devil wants you to do is just like you're on a ship and just like there's a great storm, the first thing you start doing when there's a bad storm is what? Throwing things overboard. And what Satan wants you to do, and listen to me, this is, the, this is the key, is he's wanting you to throw your faith overboard. He's wanting you to say, this doesn't work. He wants you to run. You know what? Let's just, I need to go to another church as if the church was the reason that there's a problem. As if this hour and a half that we do on a Sunday morning is somehow the reason for everything wrong in your life. It's, I, I'm just, I just need to go to another church. Okay, but guess what? The pressure's leaving with you. The pressure's not staying here. The pressure's going where you go. So don't get moved out of your prosperous place by pressure. You stand your ground in the name of Jesus. You speak over your marriage. You speak over your kids. You come against that pressure. Spend some time praying with your spouses. Michelle and I pray every Wednesday night. We pray for you. We pray for our marriage because we know the pressure that if we're feeling it, you're feeling it. Amen. Well, I'm going to continue this next week. You want to go have some cake now? <laughs> Woo, there you go. I got a better response from the cake than I did from the sermon. Now, let's stand to our feet.